you know, similarly around cognitive science, AI, artificial life, um, as it applies to certain industry verticals in robotics, transportation, healthcare, and more. So the floor is yours, Dr. Dex. Uh, okay. uh, thank you. Um, I really want to just give a completely different talk now after Raid's talk. Uh, because where he ended is actually work we're doing right now, which is how do you discover the causes of bias from observable signals rather than uh, the standard measures of bias, which simply um, basically look for discrepancies or skews in the observable statistics. Uh, basically, all measures of bias right now don't get at the underlying root causes. So we've got a, a pretty big project that's been developing methods to do that. But... That's not the set of slides that I turned in, so I don't get to give that talk. So apologies, but uh, happy to talk about it offline. Um, what I was going to talk about today is the challenge of how to build trustworthy systems. Uh, it's a term that you hear a lot. Um, the U.S. government, Executive Order 13960, says the U.S. government will use trustworthy AI in all that it does. And then you look for a definition of trustworthy and you get basically nothing. Um, there are many, many organizations that will sell you uh, software packages that are intended to help your software your, be more trustworthy. Uh, and they don't ever tell you exactly what that means beyond reliable. And we know that things that are reliable are not necessarily trustworthy. Uh, trust is going beyond mere reliability. There are a lot of things that all of us rely on, but which are not necessarily constitutive of trust. Um, so the challenge that we have I'm pushing the right button. Oh, there we go. Oh, all right. And the formatting is really wonky. I'm not sure what happens with the font formatting, but uh, we'll blame Microsoft. Um, you know, if we think about what we've had in AI, um, is we've had data first approaches. Um, in fact, it's now become uh, a thing within data science and within AI conferences, the sort of things that. Uh, the speaker from Hitachi said he doesn't go to anymore, uh, to prioritize data, to say that that's really the thing that matters. It's not about the algorithms that we all develop and use. It's not about the systems within which those algorithms or models are embedded. It's rather the data, so data-first um, AI kinds of methods, uh, particularly coming out of some folks up at UW in Seattle. And the challenge... Uh, with that is when we think about it from the perspective of trustworthy AI, we realize that essentially all of the cases where there have been notable failures of AI systems, the kinds of things that get the headlines that make it really hard for people to want to use an AI system because they say, why would I ever trust that? Um, those are all fundamentally, uh, basically, data-first approaches. So when we think about the challenges with loan approvals and the biases and loan approvals uh, algorithms, those are built using data-first approaches. Those are not built using any particular sort of knowledge ahead of time uh, or awareness. Rather, they are centered on take a bunch of data, throw it in, whatever model comes out the other end, maybe we mitigate, maybe we do a little bit of adjustment. But fundamentally, what we're trying to do is we're trying to simply find the patterns in the data. Uh, and that's been, in certain ways, spectacularly successful, of course, uh, because when we use a data-first method, what we're able to do is discover patterns that we humans have failed to find. Right? So in some sense, you might think um, that the whole premise or organizing principle of this meeting actually makes no sense. Right? Why would we do knowledge-first AI? Uh, we don't need AI for that. We just build, we call those expert systems. We built them back in the 1980s. Well, I didn't. I'm old, but not that old. Um, we don't necessarily need to do knowledge first. Why not do data first? We, we know what knowledge first gets us. It gets us the control systems that we've had all along. If we want to have better systems, we really ought to be data first. And yet then we see this whole uh, long litany of failures to produce trust with the AI. Uh, we find that when we look at the data-first approaches, they're systematically failing to produce things that are really trustworthy. And part of the reason for that um, is that when we use approaches that derive their models purely from data, those models are not necessarily going to fit 
the way that we think about the world, the way that we view the world. And you might say, right, that was the point. We wanted things that didn't understand the world as we understand the world. But the problem with that is that trust and trustworthiness is fundamentally grounded in a term that Raid used several times, which is the word values. Okay, so um, some of you here may, you know, the session title for this whole, for the sequence of uh, talks is about ethical AI in part. Um, you might be thinking, well, you know, Raid never used the word ethics. I mean, I'm half time in a philosophy department and I'm using the word ethics only to refer to it. I didn't talk about ethical AI. That's because um, I find that talking about ethical AI is actually usually counterproductive because people get scared by the word ethics. They think it's either really complicated or they think that I'm going to be the fun police, that I'm going to come in and tell them that they can't build the system they really want to build. That's not what ethical AI is. Ethical AI is simply, it's not simple, but simply building AI with an awareness of the values that are implemented through the design choices that you make in your system. Now, it's a bit of a mouthful, but the point is that all the technologies we build invariably realize and implement certain values. When you pick a loss function to optimize, you're putting values into your system. When you pick a measure of fairness that you're going to use for your bias mitigation, you're putting values into your system. When you decide that a problem is worth solving with an AI system, you're putting values into your system. You're saying, this is something that matters. This is something that's important. And that focus on values is at the core of what it is to do ethical AI. Now, that has the obvious implication that, in fact, everybody's already doing ethical AI. You may not have thought you were. Congratulations, you are. Uh, you just may not have been doing it with the kind of reflection and awareness that's important to making sure that the values that you intend to implement in your system are actually the ones that are realized there. So what does that have to do with data-first AI? Well, the problem is that data-first AI systems don't understand the world as we do. They don't represent the world as we do. Uh, just take the first case up there, self-driving cars. Um, I'm guessing most people in this room have heard of the trolley problem. Yeah, I'm getting nods. I'm sorry to even bring it up. Um, but, but if you actually, you know, the, people sometimes will ask me as a philosopher, well, what do you think of the trolley problem? And I have a lot of issues with the way it's been used. But the single biggest issue that I have with it is that it presupposes that a self-driving car understands the world like we do. It presupposes that it looks and is making a decision like, well, there's three kittens. Uh -oh. There's battery go off. I guess so. It just went orange to red. It's like a relay race. <laughs> um, so it doesn't understand the world in terms of babies and kittens and older people. It understands the world in terms of regions of space that it is not permitted to have a trajectory that passes too close to. That's the way that a self-driving car understands the world around it in many ways. And so the trolley problem just isn't how they think about the world. And that's true of all of these different cases. The ways that systems see the world is not how we do. And so the values don't actually map appropriately to what we have in mind. So um, I don't know if you guys can advance to the next slide, because this doesn't seem to be advancing yet. Thanks. I'll try and explain how the formatting was supposed to be on that. Um, so, so the idea that a lot of people are starting to have, this is starting to take a, a lot of root within um, what we're seeing in the development of trustworthy AI systems, is people saying what we really need to do is start with some core of human knowledge, whether this is intuition, common sense, scientific knowledge, whatever it may be. And then we need to build from that to build something that's trustworthy. And the idea then is, well, why might that work? Well, to understand that, we need to think about what it is for something to be trustworthy. Uh, that's a phrase or term that gets thrown around a lot. Um, it's easy for, as often happens, computer scientists to reinvent the wheel. I think they need to come up with a theory of trust from the ground up. Uh, trust is something that has been studied for 3,000 years in careful thought. Uh, it's been studied intensively for about the last 150 years. Last time I sort of did a taxonomy of trying to come up with notions of trust, there were over a dozen different uh, disciplines in which people have studied the notion of trust. Social psychology, organizational psychology, philosophy, computer science, uh, and on and on and on. Okay. And 
Although there are some minor differences, depending on whether you look at what a social psychologist says or you look at what an ethicist says, at core, every single, buddy, every single account of trust that you find boils down to these three key points. That trustworthiness is about the trustor making themselves vulnerable because they have justified expectations about the trustee supporting their values. So if I trust my wife to look after our daughter, I'm making myself vulnerable, potentially my daughter vulnerable too, but that's not what we're worried about here. I'm making myself vulnerable because I have expectations that her actions will support my values about how our daughter ought to be raised. When I trust my bank with my money, I'm making myself vulnerable. I suppose JP Morgan Chase could run off with all of my money. That would be weird, but they could. I don't have that much money there. Because of justified expectations, in part because of the regulatory systems here in the United States, that they're going to support my values with regards to care for my money. Okay? I obviously would not trust Chase to watch after my daughter. Um, and notice that these things are not necessarily about reliability. It's a sort of old joke, but, you know, I trust my wife more than my car. My car is more reliable than my wife, and she's heard that joke many times, so it's not... I'm not doing anything inappropriate. Um, the idea, though, is that when we think about this now in the context of AI, what does this mean? It means that we, as developers, as data scientists, as AI researchers and developers and designers, we need to think about how our system is going to support the values of the trust stores. We need to think about the vulnerability that people are taking on and ask ourselves, do they actually have the right expectations about what our system's going to do? And when you frame it like this, it's actually not hard to see why something like a knowledge-first approach, or at least a knowledge-centered approach, might be really useful. Because if I know that I'm building a system that views the world, as it were, through the lens of the people that I'm asking to trust the system, then... I'm more likely to be able to put them in a position that they have justified expectations, that they're, they have the right expectations about what's going to happen when they use my system, that they're not going to be confused when they use Alexa or Siri. Um, so the idea here is when we think about trustworthy AI, it's not just a buzzword. It actually has real content, and it has real impacts on how we design and develop and deploy our systems. Um, many of which I'll just note, the practices that can lead to doing this, many of the things Raid was saying actually fit this mold pretty cleanly. So where do we go with that? Well, what that means is that we need to sort of rethink exactly what it is that we're doing with trustworthy AI. Uh, it's easy to think about trustworthy AI as a thing of, well, as long as it's just reliable, then it must be trustworthy. But in fact, when we understand the nature of trust and trustworthiness, we realize it has to be value-centered. We realize that it's purpose-dependent. That's the kid money example, right? that I don't trust the bank with my kid, but I do trust them with my money. Um, that the purpose that you have for working with a system is going to matter. It means that it's community-dependent. The exact same ones and zeros used for the exact same purpose might be trustworthy for one community, but not for another one. And just think about, for example, the history of various kinds of structural racism in the United States, particularly around things like policing. It's pretty standard that if you look at how much people trust the police in the United States, you see a pretty massive uh, difference in opinion based on the color of one's skin. And so the trustworthiness is community specific. It's individual specific. Your own Individual experiences can matter for whether you trust a system or not. Okay? Um, and it's context sensitive. Depending on how you want to use it, what context you're in, that's going to make a significant difference. So this all sounds terrifying if you're an AI developer. Because part of what we try to do, part of what, when I teach data science, I emphasize to the students that is just great about data science is it works everywhere. Anywhere with data, you can use data science methods. And this sort of seems to contradict that. But what I think is actually the right way to think about it is that if we care about our systems being adopted and used by people in the right ways, we have to think seriously about the kinds of values that we're trying to realize through the systems 
And that takes the work of actually talking to people. It means that you have to go out and find out what your uh, customers, what your clients actually want. It means you need to figure out how we are going to define bias, right? So think about that uh, decision tree that Raid showed about how you choose a particular measure of bias. That's fundamentally about asking what values are we going to center into our system. Okay. So this is an argument that, uh, that I've been trying to make here that trustworthy AI is, well, it shouldn't just be a buzzword. It should, in fact, be something that you take as a tangible goal when you're developing AI systems. There are precise conditions that you can give. Right? Everything on that previous slide, those three conditions, I could spell that out in much more detail if you gave me you know, a, a semester-long class. Um, or, or even just half an hour working with somebody on a particular project. We can figure out, usually in my consulting experience, we've been able to, with most products, in about 30 minutes, figure out what would be needed for it to be trustworthy in a particular community for a particular purpose. It actually, the, the legwork of realizing that takes more time. But specking it out usually doesn't take much more time than you're spending your design meetings anyway. So it's an important goal. It is not a fuzzy or vague goal. It is, it is one that is easily realizable. And it's one that is going to require both knowledge and data. Okay. So knowledge is an important first step, but data is also critical when we want to move forward with trustworthy AI. So that's the sales pitch in the sense of uh, this is something that everyone can do. I'm getting the, the glare from the back. Uh, so I will stop and I guess we'll do some questions. Thank you, yeah, thank you. Really interesting talk. I think uh, knowledge first being, you know, potentially a better representation of the world around it. Um, that really enables that loop of trustworthy from vulnerability through justified expectations. Um, so I think we got time for a couple questions in the crowd. Start over here. Thank you. And um, this is a very nice talk from a philosophical point of view, which is very interesting for people who are data driven, right? We don't think much about what we are doing and its implication. Um, so recently for the past two to five years, explainable, interpretable AI is another set of buzzwords. How does this um, flow into the trustworthiness of an AI? Right. If it's a black box, from my perspective, then the ordinary person don't want to trust it. But from your point of view, how does the explainability and interpretability of the model play into its trustworthiness? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so uh, my view about this is that the trust, uh, sorry, the explainability or interpretability of a model uh, plays directly into that second part, the justified expectation. So how is it that I, I'm justified? I know what I'm. I have good reason to believe I know what the system's going to do. Um, that depends in part on my understanding the system and interpretability, explainability methods are ways to understand how systems work in a certain sense of understanding. So I view interpretability, explainability as a mechanism by which we can increase the trustworthiness of a system. So um, sometimes you'll see uh, I mean, Raid had a whole bunch of values that he put up there as though these were comparable. I actually think trustworthiness sort of sits above a lot of those other values. I think those other values, I'll, I'll make it the strong statement. I think that most of the other values he put up on the screen only matter because when they're present, a system is more trustworthy. And what we really care about is trustworthiness. I mean, the, the classic example of this is explainable systems that are not trustworthy at all, um, you know, it's a movie, but the Terminator can explain what he's doing. It doesn't mean I'm going to trust it, right? Or any number of other uh, fictional AI systems. But it's also true um, just because, you know, I can look and go, oh, now I see why this person was denied a loan. So now I know not to trust it, right? The explanation actually le makes me understand that I should not trust the system. And so I'm not going to use it. Um, in fact, I would actually push back and suggest that in many cases, we actually are perfectly comfortable trusting essentially black boxes. Um, you know, somewhat contentiously, we trust each other. And lots of humans are black boxes with, I mean, we think that we know why we make decisions. We don't. We're pretty bad at figuring out why we make the decisions we do. Um, and yet we trust one another. Now, 
in that case, part of the reason we trust one another is because there's a shared set of concepts and a shared set of values, we think. So I can interpret your behavior in terms of beliefs and desires and understanding objects in the world. And now I'm talking like a cognitive scientist. Um, but the point is that um, we have that ability to understand one another because we share a cognitive architecture. Um, we don't have that with an AI system. So it is probably important to have more explainable models if we want more trustworthy ones. But it's not a comp it certainly is not a competition. In fact, I think that's a way to make them be more trustworthy because we'll understand better what's going on. But it's not a requirement, I don't think. think one more question. So I, I have a question around the ceiling in which, I guess your, your thoughts on the ceiling in which um, AI is trustworthy. So we've seen some recent examples of um, AI in surgical rooms doing some aspects of surgery, um, some you know, continuous glucose monitoring and automatic pancreas. Um, do you believe that that ceiling will increase as we continue on down this AI path? Or do you believe there is some level of trust we may never uh, gain with that, that AI system? Oh boy, you're asking me for pr predictions. I hate I hate having to make predictions because um, I'm always wrong. Uh, so whatever I say, bet against it. Um, no, so I, I, I think we're going to get increasingly trustworthy systems um, in part because I think there going to be, there already are significant financial pressures for companies to make their systems at least appear to be more trustworthy. And if you build a system that only appears to be trustworthy but isn't actually, then you're setting yourself up for PR disasters when people use it and your self-driving car mode crashes into a barrier in a way that it never should. Not that that would ever happen. Um, so in that sense, I think there's going to be enormous pressures for things to become more trustworthy. Um, we don't have an argument that there's a positive ROI on making it trustworthy. I think there probably is, but nobody's got the case study for that yet. Um, is there a technical ceiling? I mean, Probably yes, in the sense of simply we live in a really complicated, what's sometimes called an open world. I mean, the, the talk about uh, self-driving cars versus self-driving trucks in a mine, I think, you know, exemplifies that. If we're in relatively closed worlds where we can largely specify the state of the environment, um, then I don't think we're going to hit a ceiling. I think we're going to be able to, to, to sort of blow through it. In terms of being able to operate in an open world, though, um, I think the challenge there is how much are we able to continue having data play a role versus knowledge play a role? Uh, are we going to trust systems that we just say, you know, we just don't understand why it works, but it just keeps working over and over? I mean, uh, Alpha Zero is a great example of this. Uh, Go players now all just trust that if Alpha Zero says this is the right move, then even if they don't get it, they go, okay, let me learn from that. Right? They don't assume that it made a mistake. Right? So, and that's the epitome of a black box. So from that perspective, I think that, um, that we're going to be getting better. Is there going to be a ceiling? I mean, you know, modern autopilots in airplanes are better than almost every single commercial pilot. And we still make the commercial pilots land the plane because we're worried about them being de-skilled and losing the ability to do the one thing that you really need to make sure you can do, which is land safely. So I think that that's, I think there are broader societal factors that'll probably keep our dependence from ever being too much. But I, I think we are going to get to points where we really can trust the system. All right, thank you, Professor Yeah, thank you. And apologies for giving a philosophical talk. I just figured nobody wants to see an equation right after lunch. So <laughs> thank you.